Hello, and welcome back to the Folgerton College Pre-Press class. This is your instructor, Professor Ben Hewitt. We are picking back up on chapter 6.7 from our book, and we are talking about imposition. Where we last left our hero, let me scoot back for a second here, we are talking about registration marks. Registration marks are marks you use when running a press to make sure that the plates are lining up. Side guide marks, in fact, are not are for a similar purpose, but they make sure that the paper is lined up to the press. If you print it correctly, it prints, ooh, I get to use a fun word here. Word here. Um, the side guide mark on the plate should be straddling the, la the edge of your paper. And in fact, it should be, here it comes, bisected. It's a fun word. Cut exactly in half. I guess if you're going more Robin Hood or older English, you'd go with split and twain. Although there's no knock or tip here, it's not talking arrows. But anyways, it needs to be split in two evenly, right down the middle. And if you get your paper to split that line in half, you get half of its thickness on the paper, half of the thickness not printed. And when you look at the stack of paper that's been printed, you can see that beautiful grayness where that thin line is on the very edge of each sheet on top of each other. And in fact, you can also look at the edge of the stack and at the bottom of this picture, you can see those bottom papers were not perfectly aligned. You can see that there are, you can see white on the edge and not black. It doesn't matter which direction it drifts. If it drifts so much as a single point, actually a point is a lot, a 72nd of an inch is a lot. I guess it's really a hundredth of an inch is about 150th of an inch is about where you'd be with the uh, 144th. Ew, that's gross. 144th of an inch is your tolerance for it staying on the page. And if you move even a hair in either direction, it, the line disappears because it has to be right there on the edge. So if you look at the stack, you can see if there are any that are out of register. You can in fact see two lines in this stack as well. Let's see if my mouse will do it for you down here. Uh, let's annotate actually. Do, do, do. Where's my draw? Let's draw a line right down here. Ooh, how fun. You can see there are two lines coming through that of papers that don't have a black on the edge. You can see it ran out of register in that spot at a glance, easily. And then typically speaking, you just kind of recycle those sheets. You take them out of the print job and you chuck them because they're not gonna cut correctly. They're not gonna fold correctly. They're not lined up right. So you don't want those. That's one of the reasons you always print more than you think you need. If the customer orders 100, you print 110 and you pick the 100 best out of that 110. You know, about 10% over is a good general rule for uh, making sure you have enough. So that's the side mark. The gripper. Remember, paper does not just magically float through the printing press. There's no tractor beams. There's no weird magnetic science that somehow holds paper floating in the air and draws it through magically. It doesn't exist. It's all done physically and mechanically. To get the paper through a press, the paper must be grabbed by something. It must be picked up by little hands that grab it and pull it through. They're called grippers. They grip it. And the grippers look different in different presses. Some of them kind of look like little tiny paper clips. Some of them look more like metal claws. Uh, depends on the press. Some of them look like neither of those. But in any case, they all grab onto the edge of the paper and pull it through. The gripper edge cannot be printed on in the same way that uh, in the old Greek stories, Achilles' heel was not uh, invincible because when his mom dipped him in the river, she held him by the heel and the part that was covered by her hand didn't touch the river that made him invincible. Anyways, so uh, back to what we're sorry, I got lost in my Greek mythology here, uh, but the grippers hold part of the paper and you can't print where those are because they're in the way. So that has to be part of the sheet you don't get to use. The gripper edge is marked with X's. Plate bend. This is the part where the plate literally bends around the edge of the plate cylinder. You can see it in here on the little picture here. You can't use that for printing. That belongs to the press. That's used for mechanically attaching the plate. Now we'll talk about imposition styles. They're sheet wise. Work and turn and work and tumble are very similar to each other and change only in one little tiny detail. There's multi-up and there's combination. Let's go through these. So jobs want to be set up the most efficient way possible. I always maintain that, 
and it's not like it's my thing. Come on, guys, this is, this is standard industry stuff. Uh, it's pretty foolish, unless you're printing a big thing that takes up the whole sheet of paper, it's foolish to print anything less than filling your sheet with as many copies of what you can do. Printing one thing on one sheet of paper is wildly inefficient. We need to be cramming as much as we can on there for many reasons. To save the environment, to use less trees, to spend less money, to spend less time. To print a shorter print run, which will be easier to color manage. If you print the longer the run, the more it's like rolling the dice. The more times you roll the dice, the more likely you are to get a result you don't want. So print less and you'll do better. So less sheets printed makes everything better. So in position, you should always be trying to get as much as possible onto your sheet. So you can use one or a combination. I don't really like how this goes with the bottom because combination is one of them. You can use one or more of these things to set it up. Let's go into what they are. Sheetwise. <clears throat> Sheetwise needs two sets of plates. Sheetwise means you are printing one side of whatever it is on one side of the paper, and you will print the back side, if there is one, a second time. Or maybe not a second time. Sheet, well, yeah, never mind. If it's on a web, all bets are off, guys. If you're running a web press with a perfecting press where it prints both sides at the same time, then the first couple of these don't matter. Sheet fed is most common for uh, book printing. But anyways, so you need two sets of plates, one for the front, one for the back. After you print it, the press sheet is flipped over si side to side. The same gripper edge is maintained. See those X's by the word front and the X's above the word back? Those X's tell you that's where the gripper is going to hold it. So you flip it over end to end, side to side, and you leave the ends where they were, and you print it a second time with a second set of plates. Sheetwise is good when you need to print big. If you're printing a giant poster, it's going to be sheetwise, almost guaranteed, because you have to fit, you're not going to be able to fit two posters unless you have a really gigantic press. You're going to need to fit only one poster per sheet of paper when printed. That's one of the reasons they cost a, a decent penny when you go to shops that sell posters, um, especially good ones. Um, if you're printing on good paper, you're spending a lot of paper and a lot of time and effort to get that on there because it's all that printing is only on one thing. And normally that amount of printing is going to get you, you know, an entire signature out of a book. Anyways, moving on. Work and turn and work and tumble both do the same thing. Work and turn and work and tumble both put the front and the back of whatever you're printing onto the same plate. You print it once, you flip it over, you print it a second time using the same plate, and where the front was is now getting the back printed, and where the back was is now getting its front printed. It's clever. Anyways, work and turn means you keep the same gripper edge and you flip it side to side. Work and tumble is almost the same thing, except that you flip end to end instead of side to side. You change gripper, you change the gripper side to the other side. That's the difference. Uh, they both do the same thing otherwise, but the difference is which direction the paper flips. This matters a lot depending on what needs to be where. If there are special finishing concerns that need a certain edge of the paper to be embossed or stamped or numbered or die cut and you need to be able to cut just that corner, that is where the work and tumble versus work and turn comes in because it will help you align the thing where it needs to be for the finishing process. Typically, work and turn is used. Work and tumble is more special for when you have finishing concerns that require a certain corner of a page to be in the certain corner of your sheet. They both do the same job otherwise. The thing is, work and turn keeps things in a tighter front to back registration. Work and tumble makes sure that a certain thing is in a certain place on the general press sheet. Multi up, I use this one all the dang time, and hopefully you do too. That means you put more than one copy on it. It would be foolish to print out a business card, or it is one business card, three and a half by two inches in the US, in the middle of an eight and a half by 11 sheet, or worse, 11 by 17, or worse, a parent sheet. That is super wasteful and super inefficient. Multi up means get as many of those things on there as you possibly can. When I was young and still learning my trade and uh, working only like my second or third print job, I had a uh, supervisor boss guy who always insisted that we squeeze one more on, which meant I couldn't rely on software to do it for me. I had to manually impose, which is a bit of a bummer, but in the end, we were able to get five postcards on a sheet that would normally only hold four by manually putting it on ourselves. Wasn't fun. It was a little tricky, 
but it saved a lot of paper and a lot of time. So props to him for figuring that one out. Anyways, multi-up means if you're going to print business cards, you better be getting at least 20 on that sheet because you don't want to have to print a million sheets for a million cards. You should be able to print a quarter million sheet. Oh, quarter million for only four here. Uh, do the math yourself. Combination. Various forms on the same press sheet. Combination can also mean multiple jobs on the same press sheet. I know them as a gang run from, uh, from my industry time out here in California. They might call it somewhere else, something else somewhere else. But uh, a lot of jobs will, or companies will do this. If you're printing business cards for a lot of different customers and all these customers want their business cards printed on the same 100 and, or sorry, whoops, 100 pound is kind of too light. Let's go 14 point or 18 point stock and they all want the same gloss coating, why are you printing them separately? It's more efficient to make one set of plates for two or three customers and then just cut and separate, just separate them after they're being cut. So that is a, a way things are often done. Also, it can mean that if you're doing it cleverly, you can have work and turn or work and tumble. So you have the fronts and backs of multiple people's different cards or multiple people's small booklets on the same larger sheet. It's all about maximizing the plate size you have available to you to print as much as possible in one go. So concerns for imposition, things you wanna look at, things that are gonna make you choose one or another. You're gonna look for paper size, what size paper can you print on, page size, what is the output size of what you're doing? That, those are the biggest ones. Page count, how many sheets are you doing? Because sometimes you want to change it up based off of that. Is bleed necessary? It's not always if you don't have any bled artwork, but we'll talk about that. Creep factor is a problem with large signatures and actually is one of the things that limits what a saddle stitch booklet can do. The method of bindery, registration or register concerns, and paper grain direction. Remember from bindery that paper grain direction needs to run parallel to the last fold you're going to do. So all these things work together to kind of determine and dictate what kind of paper you need to use and what kind of imposition. So bindery methods, saddle stitching, you staple it on the spine. I'm sorry, saddle stitching. I know that was kind of a abusive language to you there, but yeah, saddle stitching means you end up with staples from a wire that gets sewn through it. Saddle stitching puts multiple sheets together in the middle and you onto a single fold. Saddle stitching is a one signature job. Oh, actually, maybe not always. I take that back. Um, you can print multiple signatures, but saddle stitching runs into problems. We'll talk about that when we get there a little bit later because other types can also run into that. Perfect binding has different issues. Perfect binding means the edges of the paper are glued together. They can be loose leaf or folded four page signatures, which remember is a single sheet folded in half once. Perfect binding requires very minimal trimming and has no folded edges on the edges, outsides. And also when we get to talking about creep, Perfect binding has no creep or should have no creep unless you're doing a really bad job folding. If you're perfect binding and you see creep happening, you're doing something really wrong because this method just bypasses the whole issue. Bleeds. Remember, it's impossible to make a sandwich with no crust by baking bread with no crust. Just by baking bread, you get a crust. If you want a sandwich like mom used to make with no crust because you're a picky kid, well then, the only way to do that is to make regular bread in a regular sandwich and cut the crust off. In the same way, there's no way to print to the edge of the piece of, to the edge of what you're doing. Either the piece of paper can't be big enough to go in, to a, I mean, you have to hold it somewhere with a gripper, so you can't print to the edge of the paper there. Also, trying to trim it, it's near impossible to print, to cut a stack of print jobs so precisely that you can cut on the line of where the ink stops and expect it to look the same the whole way down the stack. Things move in cutters. They're not 100% precise. They are, anytime you do any machine that physically handles paper, it's gonna make some changes and not always the ones you want. So we extend any graphics that we want to go to the edge of our paper an eighth of an inch past it. For all you metric people out there, that's three millimeters. I just did the head math to make sure. Yes, three millimeters. Anyways, if you give any printer anywhere an eighth of an inch bleed, they'll love you for it. That's all they need. And let me tell you, having been pre-pressed for a decade, I spent a lot of my life on the phone with customers telling them exactly what I just told you. And if you get into pre-press, you can pass on the knowledge. Creep, creep. Creep is also called push out. Creep is 
when you fold a bunch of sheets together into a signature, it looks like the middle pages are sticking out farther than the front and the back covers. And this is because they are. There's a reason when you run races for like the Olympics and stuff that the runners always start out staggered so that they're standing behind each other and they start running, but they end in a straight line because it's easier to call the ending that way. That's because the outside of the racetrack is a longer line. The outside of a circle is bigger than the inside of a circle. And although paper is oftentimes taken for granted as an example of what two-dimensional things are, which really bothers me because paper has a thickness, it is solidly, pun intended solidly, huh? solidly three-dimensional. So creep means as you fold paper, every sheet you fold around the spine has to go around the sheet that was folded before. And the next sheet has to go around both of those sheets. The next sheet has to go around those sheets. This is also why in that Mythbusters video we looked at a while ago about folding paper, it gets so thick as you fold it. The, the, the actual bend starts taking more and more space. So this is one of the things that limits how useful saddle stitching is and limits how much you can do. So you have to trim this off to make it evenly spaced, an even book face. You're losing more of some pages, not all your pages, not all your pages. No, none of your pages are the same size. Some of them are up to like a quarter of an inch smaller in the middle of the book than they are in the front and the back of the book. That's something to account for in layout and in design. And also something, one of the reasons you wanna to push to minimizing how thick each individual signature gets within a book. Other things to look at, register. Areas that need to be registered more closely to look better. Like if you have a lot of pictures on one side of the page, that needs to be closer to the gripper because that's where things are gonna be more accurate. The paper is more stable on the gripper side when it goes to the press than on the tail end, which I'm not trying to make it sound like it's flapping in the breeze, but you know, it has a little bit more wiggle room. Uh, things can shift between the gripper and the tail end of the sheet, but close to the gripper, the, any sort of shift is not gonna be seen very much. And lastly, the paper grain direction matters. The papers must be parallel to the backbone or the spine of the book, or else you're not gonna get a good book. If it's perfect bound, why, the pages can tear themselves out of the book as they expand and contract by heat and uh, moisture differences. Also, it won't fold open or lay open very well. It'll fight you as you try to read through it. So you try to make sure that the grain direction always runs parallel to the spine. This has been in position. I know it's a slightly longer video than I normally do, but I think that's better than the third video. I hope. Thanks for listening. And remember, this is a very important one to keep in mind when you're doing designs and layouts. Bye for now.